Tonight, we reassess terrorism prevention in Nigeria and other African countries. And Atiku's aide Frank Shoaibu and Festus Kayamo bicker over asset declaration and investigation of the 52 billion Naira SWP fund. This is Plus Politics, and I am Mary Anacol. This year's Global Terrorism Index has revealed that 60% of deaths attributed to violent extremist groups in 2022 occurred in sub-Saharan Africa. Many Africans have borne uh, the brunt of the decades-long insecurity. Communities have been experiencing continuous trauma resulting from these insurgencies, terrorist attacks, political violence, socioeconomic, political, religious and ethnic marginalization, genocides and civil wars. Intercommunal violence and lack of social cohesion have been known to contribute to the recruitment by groups on the continent and despite many prevention efforts, the threat of terrorism still persists. Well, it's time for us to reassess what needs to go into preventing violent extremism and specifically recruitment into terror groups in Africa. Joining us live tonight to discuss this is Lawrence Alobi. He is a former commissioner of police uh, at the FCT. And also joining us is Eugene Abels, executive director, Extra Step Initiative. Thank you very much, Mr. Alobi, for joining us. Good evening. Yeah, thank you for having me. My pleasure. Great. Let's start by looking at some of the causes or some of the recruitment processes that have enabled these sleeper cells that have gradually become terrorist um, you know, sects across the country, even um, the continent. Uh, many people have said that um, unemployment, underemployment, um, and idleness, obviously, has caused many of these people to become a tool in the hands of some of these recruiters who have recruited them into uh, sects, either through religious extremism or, you know, as a result of poverty. Um, again, Nigeria, as we all know, is still on the poverty index, whether we like it or not, and we're not actually properly placed. And this could also be a pointer uh, to one of the reasons why we're having more and more of these young people join these sects. If we must deal with the situation, should we not be starting at looking at good governance yeah, good governance is a, is, is a very major factor. First, we have to look at the causal factor. What are those causes? Those are those factors that can exacerbate terrorism, violent, uh, violent attack, and so forth. Like what are those happening in Imo State, where five policemen were brutally murdered by a group on, of unknown persons, like you said? And what's happening in Northeast and other part of the country? So, there are a lot of factors it could be social, political, political, economic, and so forth. The like economic dimension of poverty, unemployment. When, like, and most of those who are being recruited to the terrorist, uh, ter terrorism are the poverty, again, family background. Some parents have failed to counsel and guide their children and inculcate their children trustworthy moral character. Because if a child, a young man is well counsel and guided that the family values are very important, they will be able to adhere to those values. The family is the, the, the agent of socialization. When the children are being socialized to those moral spiritual values, where they appreciate that they have to do those, the right thing and obey the laws of the, of the land and obey their parents, they will, be, they, they, will, they will not be so gullible to being prone to being equal to the terrorist act. Again, the government too of the country has failed to a large extent. We used to have, remember, we used to have in the past years, well, the, the, the Mansa, sorry, the Operation Y operation, where, uh, where we had mission orientation when Jerry, Jerry Ghana was there. We had that conscious that was created among in the hands of Nigerians. When even that's of indiscipline was indiscipline was not tolerated in the society. Women cannot even shunt in a queue in the bank. 
but because the government has dealt with national orientation has failed to perform its functions to create a Nigerian consciousness, content, content, to be able to incorporate the most patriotic spirit in Nigerians. And these young ones believe that since the government has failed them, they can look for an alternative source of, of living, source of survival. In like basic needs of man, like Maslow, the story of social, the material of motivation, we say, these physiological needs, social needs, those needs are needed by the human being. Mm. So, again, like I talk about um, unemployment, poverty, and then other social factors, also political. Mm. In this country, they have a lot of factors like marginalization. Some group of persons are believed to be marginalized, and again, some people are indoctrinated to a religious ideology. We and they, uh, uh, we and we and we and their mentality, and they see others as a threat, and only they through by doing what they are by using uh, violence they can achieve their goal. They see violence as, as a legitimate means of achieving their objective and goal. So these are the other factors that can actually help in checking the recruitment, increased recruitment of the young ones, Nigerians, to terrorism and other African countries terrorism. The government should, therefore, provide the necessary infrastructures on employment, poverty alleviation programs, making sure that Nigerians, Nigerians, Nigerians have a, a, very trust, a, a very good life. Today, Nigeria is said to be one of the poorest countries in the world, in spite of all our rich resources, both natural resources and human capital resources. But then, Leadership, good leaders, leaders will bring about good governance. Now, if in the next few days, we'll be we'll be enthroning another government, another government. That will be that will, that, will, that will now bring a new chapter to our, our Nigerian, Nigerian, Nigerian political life. It's only when the government is committed, when the government that has empathy, the government is people oriented, the government is concerned, we have a vision to ensure that the right thing is done. Mm. These are some of the factors that can help to checkmate the recruitment of young ones to to into those places. Because if we have good, good leadership and good governance, then people will enjoy the dividends of democracy, the dividends of good governance, mm. then, like employment, good living standard, um, 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 infrastructural development, economic economic problem, security will be tackled and so forth. Security challenge will be, be addressed. Economic problem will be addressed. Political, 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 political violence will be, will be segmented, and a crime will be segmented, and that will make society and secure for, for all law-abiding citizens. Yeah, very interesting that you've laid out some of these points. But let's let me start with the last thing that you said. Um, politics. Uh, many have pointed. In fact, let's start with Boko Haram and how Boko Haram became a thing. In Nigeria, many have pointed to the fact that political thuggery, uh, which has been a tool in the hands of politicians across this country, uh, was what metamorphosed into Boko Haram. People were given guns um, to fight against their detractors, and then, of, of course, right after that, they were abandoned as usual. And so, of course, they had to use what they had to get what they want. And now. We, we have a big monster that we have to deal with. Even though the federal government tells us that Boko Haram has been technically defeated and they're now in the fringes, as, it, uh, as opposed to what it used to be before, we've now seen different things. It has also, again, metamorphosed into uh, kidnapping, into banditry, cattle rustling, and unknown gunmen. So let's look at the politics of it, political thuggery. We just finished an election which, of course... Um, uh, has left a lot of people with frayed nerves and many wondering what the future holds for uh, the electoral process of this country. Um, what do we do in the first instance to deal with the issue of political thug, especially for those of us who live in Lagos? I I'm sure, sir, you saw some of the videos that came out of Lagos during the elections and how thugs were openly um, threatening um, voters at polling units. If this is, of course, the order of the day, and we're seeing that we're having many more people are, are seeing that this political thug repays in a way, and then that these people go scot-free, will we ever be able to put, a, um, you know, put to bed this issue of terrorism, this issue of insecurity, uh, being that it looks like it's being rewarded every other day? So why and how would we want to put an end to it? Yes, thank you very much for raising this issue. You see, our political class, our politicians, 
They are, they are so premised by power and materialism. During elections, during campaigns, they mobilize talks, they mobilize young men, mobilize call groups, and arm them to fight their perceived enemies. And after the election, election, after the campaign elections, they will not be able to disarm these young men. These armed young men see in position of this, this illegally acquired or uh, possessed firearms. And in the process, when the elections are over, the young men now they they they, 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 they get involved into other crimes like kidnapping, kidnapping, uh, um, uh, cattle rustling, and other violent crimes. And in, the, in that in that key situation, the the civilian the, 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 the police, police can no longer dis, they won't be able to be able to disarm them because the boys are now empowered with the guns. They are now empowered to use those guns. When no police, when when there's no more politics, you are going to commit other violent crime. So our politicians are the most of the have come to mostly to some of the problems we have in this country today because they see police as a, as a very lucrative business. Some of them see police as a profession. Say I'm a politician. I can say politics is a profession. Politics is not a politician. It's not, it's not, it's not a profession. In that climate, but here in Nigeria, we see police as a profession. And they see it, it is a do or die. You must grab it either by hook or by crook. And in that process, they put about moral values, put about spiritual values to the background. And what they're concerned is how to achieve it by hook or by crook. And in that process, and they see violence as utilized using violence as legitimate means. And they help the average young men and the young men, the young men go out for their perceived enemies that are identified by their masters or principals. And at the end, they cause havoc and mayhem, kill innocent people, and they continue in the art of violence. They even get these young men drugged. They get drugged, they get them drugged, and they go out, all they go, they know it's violence, to this destruction. So there are so many, if, if, if this political class, it will make, it make politics less lucrative, political appointment, less lucrative. I know that it's see, let me inculcate the culture of service. Service, service to humanity, service to our country, and mm -hmm. service to to God. Okay. If we imbibe this attribute of service, we'll be able to overcome this act of violence, this act of greed and mentalism, and our society will be better for all of us. All right, let me go to you, Eugene. Eugene, um, l let me pick up from where the former commissioner stopped. Um, again, the issue of terrorism continues to linger. And I want to ask you why you think it's lingered so, for so long. For example, the Buhari administration rolled on the wings of fighting terrorism and putting it, you know, uh, to an end. But here we are, a few days before Mr. President uh, is about to hang, hand over to the president-elect. And we're still talking about reassessing the issue of terrorism in Nigeria. And we know that it's not just Nigeria that's experiencing it, but ours seems to, you know, um, continue to be on the up and up, even though it might not be Boko Haram, but of course, they're different. It's, it's metamorphosed into a hydra-headed monster. Why do you think it's lingered for so long? Yes, um, first of all, I'd just like to do a basic intro. Um, we, we, we have this misnomer to blame less than 20,000 people who were elected into office. Now, out of this, we are at a nation of supposed, which is a lie, about 200 million people. Less than 20,000 are elected into office. And you have another 5 million, 6 million people spread all over the states, including the federal government, who are the bureaucracy, who constitute the bureaucracy and the government. And um, they outlive each political cycle. So when we blame the politicians, we don't want to come to realization that the enforcers of the decisions of even the bad decisions of the 20,000 elected officials are members of the bureaucracy who are the government, who have been trained for over 30 years to ensure that those failures and gaps, that they teach these people how to govern, they direct them, they show them the ropes, and they ensure that if there, are, if there are failures, that those failures must be addressed by way of sanctions because there are judges, there are magistrates, there are EFC officials, there are soldiers, there are policemen, and the rest of them. The bureaucracy has failed. 
the bureaucracy is responsible for where we are today because they teach the if they say they will not act. Let me give you a typical letter. Imagine that the woman who runs the National Bureau of Statistics decides to be politically correct. She wouldn't be telling us the true story of the state of affairs of the economy. Do you know how they would consider, consider it to be very loyal? You should have kept telling us that they, we are not owing. She's lying about the figures, about employment figures and the employment figures and all of that. That is where our problem is. We had an election. The first election happened. People died as we speak, despite the assurances that were given to us. Nobody has been sanctioned. And we opened our chest and went for another election. People died. We have not accounted for them, why they died, why violence, why those cycles of violence happened. Because we didn't do, do those things, what happened in Adamawa happened, which was the height of effrontery, and we're suddenly sounding or finding it um, offensive. Don't forget that the man in charge, the REC, had postponed the announcement of results to 11 a.m., and members of the bureaucracy, the commissioner of police and some other security officials went with another man who was not authorized to announce results, sat by him and allowed him to announce results. Meaning, first of all, either they didn't know what the rules say or they were in concern to what was about to happen. So we have, our society has failed. We are looking at, we're just running all over the place, calling symptoms and no, 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 no. The fundamentals have failed. The fundamentals are of a basic society, and the reason why the, next, the, 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 why the concept of government was created, there will be rules, and those rules must be governed and protected. And for the sake of the nation and her sovereignty, that's why she's a sovereign, that there are people who will stand up to those people who have short political lifespans, eight years maximum, and tell them, no, you can't do this. This is against the law. We will prevent it. That's why you have the Code of Conduct Bureau. That's why you have the Consumer Protection Agency. That's why you have the courts. You have so many agencies, people who are earning salaries, who have refused to do their job, and we have refused to sanction them because we're pointing in the wrong direction. Politics. Any man who decides to play politics and then a living from it is a profession. We see... But Joe Biden was a politician all his life. He has never worked anywhere. There are lots of them in America. Some of them are in their 80s and, and so on. So it's anybody who has stepped into the public fora. I'm not interested in what you want to call it. But for the fact that you've taken responsibility, those who are paid, who earn, who earn salaries, should do what they're supposed to do. Now, we... Who but, 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 but who makes them do what they're supposed to do? Because you see, the, the Joe Bidens of this you. world and all of those people who are in those places, they are there to serve. They're not there to receive their hardship allowances or to fight for um, their cars. They're there to serve and they're accountable to people. But in this, in this part, like you said, the elections are flawed. Our votes don't count. So who's going to hold who to, uh, to account if these people outrightly are the ones who are snatching ballot boxes so that they can find themselves in those places? Why should they be answerable to us? Yes, because we, the employees, employers, have shared our responsibility of making them accountable. Don't forget that this, what is happening now, is not the standard. In 1984, President Buhari was General Buhari, and... Something happened in ABU Zaria. All the male students, you know, presidents ran away. It was the girls who were vice presidents that brought the nation to a standstill. We've been in the democracy, everybody's claiming. We didn't, they didn't give us as a piece of cake. People stood their ground. We're the employers. It's our responsibility to insist that they give us service. If we have to shut down the system, we shut down the system. If you keep letting things go, you take your child to school and you don't ask the child for his own work or see what the child says. Whatever you see at the end of the day, it is for it is you deserve it as a parent. We employed them. They are using their taxes to run the system. If we don't ask questions and get a mention a mediocrity which the politicians throw at us, then we will remain where we are. We if we like to pray from now to tomorrow. We all, it's our responsibility to call that counselor to order. 
It's our responsibility to demand. That's why when we felt that there were gaps left, we said the second election shouldn't hold until certain things were put in place. We did the extra step initiative. We did a seven-page um, public announcement to that effect. But the average person was thinking of how they were going. Guys, you, you're expecting equity in a place where the goalposts already have been shifted. That's like sheer madness or suicidal. We need to begin to think. They throw, they control the narrative, throw the standard. People are no longer thinking. And we're beginning to, we're beginning to think that this is the standard. They want to do census. Nobody's going to count me. You can't count me. Why do you want to count me? Why am I, how am I sure? I know that census is a major political weapon that is used for the allocation of resources. How am I sure you're going to be fair? When the basics which you should do, you haven't done. And you can, for security agencies, you came and announced 40,000, 50,000 people will be on a lot and that. I'm not asking, all I'm asking for the funds that were allocated for those jobs. Who are the people who died during the elections? Who killed them? Why did they die? Those who threatened people, what have you done about them? Why are the cases in court taking forever? Why are things done? What is happening? If we don't ask questions and demand service, we will allow less than 20,000 people to continue to pull us by the nose. And this has been going on since 1999. Mm -hmm. So the earlier we wake up to this reality, the better. The, our destiny is in our hands. It is mm. us and only us that can deliver us from this situation. Let me come back to former CP Lawrence Alobi. You, you obviously um, were here when we had the NSAS. Now, Eugene is saying that we must take um, the, the initiative to push um, for answers to questions that we raise to make sure that these people are accountable. Uh, let's go back to NSAS. The last time that people said, well, this is what we want. We want accountability. We want an end to police brutality. We want good governance. We want, um, you know, um, to make sure that the average young person or the average Nigerian is safe in Nigeria. Um, the man who pays taxes sees what his taxes are paying for. Um, the last time we saw that happen, um, it didn't necessarily end well. And uh, the next time that we also wanted to see that kind of mass protest, we saw the full weight of government out on the streets and people were harassed and, and you know, um, arrested. So again, when we say that we're asking for governments to be responsible, and just like Eugene said, a handful of people seems to be holding us uh, at the juggler, then what does the future hold for us? How do we even get uh, that, those answers that we're looking for if, for every time we try? Uh, we have water cannons in our faces. Yeah, before I go into the the post uh, uh, answers uh, problem challenges or lesson learned, uh, let me first refer, refer to, uh, respond to what you just said. You see that the, the bureaucrats are the one causing the problem. The bureaucrats are employed by 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 the the political class. Mr. President appoints all the the the, 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 the chief, chief judge the chief judge of the federation, just of the federation, makes appoint ministers, and these employees, employees, they are employees employed by the government, and the government that details you will pay the pipe at the things the two ninety as it is said, the government have their have their have, have their objective what they want to achieve, and if an employee which is the civil servant does not comply. With the instructions, it is said that you have to be loyal. And like some you said that loyalty is 100%. You have to be loyal to, com to comply with what they have said, told you to do. If you don't do it, they'll kick you out. Because for us, look at, look at what they're doing the ASU strike. How many of them on strike? The government came out that no pay, no, no work, no pay. And what happened? So, and they started negotiation. So I think to a large extent, the bureaucrat, it is a systemic problem. We are all responsible. Both the politicians, the, but the citizens, the political class, everybody is responsible. We're, we're, these are all contributing factors to the, the problem we're having today. They know about the NSAS, for instance. What lesson do we learn from NSAS? The NSAS protest was like a revolution. It is a miniature revolution. That it, it cut across the whole country, and until when it was contained by government, 
and they were asking for 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 good governance against against police brutality and also they, 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 they also called for police reform that will make the police a better a better police force that will actually police and enforce law in line with the best practices practices and also they see that uh, rights women rights have been have been have been promoted and protected he talking about you see when we said we take our hands everything by our hands it like I said leadership also determines followership there's no way said we call for a revolution and that revolution can start through by we also revolution revolutionizing our our conduct our character character is everything character transformation we talk about character that's what I talk about the family upbringing family counseling moral values moral character somebody character and then the orientation orientation also trying to inculcate in our Nigerian citizens those values mm. that will promote national cohesion, national unity, and patriotic spirit among Nigerians. Okay. I know revolutions are not, are, not, are not things that are done by everybody. Few hands can climb. Like, what, like if, if, if the answer, for instance, had, con had continued, I think it will, it, will cause, it will have some challenges, but also some, some benefit. So I think that we are responsible. Okay. All right. And I think well, now that we anticipate a new government in power come to May, May 29th, we pray that the government of um, Chinobo will have a vision that will be concerned about people needs driven administration, okay. people needs driven governor, not government that is there to loot, okay. government that is there to amass wealth and impoverish the people, not government that is there to promote insecurity. Okay. Because when you promote poverty and unemployment, you're promoting insecurity. Okay. And when you promote... When, you, when our leaders are corrupt, corrupt, they also promote security because corruption will bring about a based on public funds, both funds that are supposed to be used usually to promote infrastructural development, provide schools, and good education, good, med good medical facilities, okay. and so forth. This money is being diverted by, by, by corrupt politicians. Okay, Mr. Alabi. All right, Mr. Alabi, because we don't have time, let me finally wrap up here with Eugene. Eugene. Um, with what we've seen and going forward, do you think that we're really ready to deal with the issue of terrorism? Don't forget that there, we're also, I mean, there's, there's just, is this is a multifaceted issue. The people that have been displaced as a result of terrorism have been re-displaced again. And it, it seems like these terrorists have tested our government, tested our security agencies, and somewhat also seen the body language of our political class and continued in their ways because we saw like there was a, a little pause before the elections and then of course they they, they came back um, ten times harder. How ready are you? Do you think we are as a country to deal with the issue of terrorism, or are we even serious about it? Okay, first of all, we have. Um, I'll just give a background. We have chief executives. Number one is the president. Then you have the state governors. Then the local government chairman. None of them can sack any civil servants. They can only sack those who they are appointed. Now, I'll take you back into history. River State, there was a doctor called Dr. Denny Fibesma, was a commissioner under military rule. He was not happy with the way, the things the governor wanted to do. He resigned. Under the amnesty program, when Jonathan was taking over, the, the director of finance was, he didn't want, he wanted money to be left for the incoming government. And he refused to sign. And those funds were there. Now, I'll take you down to River State, when the, um, the uh, crack, Eagle Crack Squad did what they did that killed those mechanics. If people like us didn't do that, which the courts now have granted um, a judgment of a 75 million uh, against the state, against um, the, uh, those concerned, if we didn't put our, our grounds down, 45 people would have rotted in prison. Mm. Those boys who are, that boy who was killed would have just died for nothing. We need to take a position. There are no excuses for it. Now, bringing it to the terrorism we see today, we all know it's based on politics. Yes, and um, whenever I look at the soundbar on uh, AIT, I weep. I don't like looking towards them because they keep statistics of what's happened. Uh, and I pray nobody tempts me. I have two daughters uh, because I would definitely come after those people who are concerned. I will not wait for this. I will seek a resort to self help. Now, in eight years, we've not had one sponsor. Why do I chase the men, the food soldiers? We are the sponsor. When I can trace the money, mm. 
Where are the sponsors? Nothing. So it's all politics. The all of us are dancing naked on the graves of those girls, kids who were impregnated, some have four children, six children, and we're laughing at it. Now, going forward to the incoming administration, two things must be done, which I know they will do, if they want to survive. I know they will do. Uh, Bola Ahmed Tinibu, in the incoming president. Uh, it's not about whether he won the, he's the, going to be sworn in. Now, when he comes here, he must, he has to deal with the economy and he has to deal with his security. He okay. doesn't have a choice. All right. He just doesn't have a choice, yeah. Okay. And uh, for him to survive and do the things he want to achieve for himself and for his administration, he has okay. no option but than to deal with this. So there's likely to be complaints that will come to you complain very well, soon that he's high handed, but it's the only way to go. Somebody well, has to bite the bullet and kick some asses. All of that remains to be seen, but I want to say thank you, gentlemen, because we're out of time. Um, Eugene Abels is Executive Director, Extra Step Initiative, and uh, uh, Lawrence Alobi is the former Commissioner of Police, FCT. Thank you so much, gentlemen, for being part of the conversation. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. All right. Yeah. Up next, we turn our attention to the probing of the SWP fund and calls for the declaration of Festus Kiyama's assets. Stay with us.